All right, so chapter number 10, electrolysis. Um, if, even if I just discuss the word electrolysis itself, the word electro is actually coming out of electricity and the word lysis actually means breakdown. So we'll be breaking down some uh, solid compounds through passing electricity through them and uh, that's what electrolysis is going to be all about. Now we do understand that when I talk about some solid compounds, they're going to be any compounds because uh, metals either react with water or they don't, they don't exactly dissolve in water. When it comes to covalent compounds, they don't dissolve in water either. And it's just any compounds which do that. And when it comes to conducting electricity, I hope you understand metals conduct electricity. But that's very different. Nothing happens to their structure. Covalent compounds do not conduct electricity at all. A part of a few, a uh, couple of examples here and there, they don't. And for the ionic compounds, they conduct electricity in specific states. So, what we're going to do is to begin with uh, how a solid conduct electricity or how some liquids conduct electricity. Then from there on onwards, we'll discuss the type of bonding and we'll bifurcate and we'll slowly move towards electrolysis. So starting off with the first thing, as I just said, why things conduct electricity? Uh, we need to remind ourselves why do the things conduct electricity or why do they don't? Then in order to conduct electricity, we know something there must be present are charged particles there must be some positive or negatively charged particles in a system, in a substance for it to conduct electricity. And those charged particles should be free to move too. So there are actually two conditions. First, there should be charged particles present. Secondly, those charged particles are free to move as well. Charged particles can be electrons or they can be positive or negative ions. So that's what we are going to study today. Starting off with metals. We do understand metal is made up of a lattice. The lattice is composed of positive ions. Now they are surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons in which those delocalized electrons are free to move. And that's the sole reason behind the conductivity of metal. Because the negatively charged delocalized electrons are free to move. Now, if I move on to ionic compounds, ionic compounds, such as sodium chloride, diacetyl iodide, different examples, different solids. Now, they do not conduct electricity when they're solid. Yeah, they are made up of ions, positive and negative ions, but the problem is those ions are held tightly in a position. They're not free to move around. They can only vibrate, and that doesn't count. So they can conduct electricity when they're molten, uh, because then the ions are free to move or when they are dissolved in water, aqua solution, then the ions are free to move. So this one actually uh, completes both the conditions in molten or aqua system. They have ions, positive and negative particles, and they can free to move, but when they're molten or when they're dissolved in water. Remember ions were negative or positive. We used to call negative ions as anions, and positive ions as cations. We used these names previously, we're going to use the same names ahead. Now moving on, covalent compounds. The covalent compounds are mostly the compounds that are uh, made by sharing of electrons, covalent bonding. They do not conduct electricity in any state or in any solution. Now they are consisting of individual molecules. Those molecules don't even have an electrical charge. There are no charged particles to move around. All the electrons are tightly bound in atoms or in covalent bonds. They're not free or able to move from molecule to molecule. So there won't be any conductivity. However, there are some exceptions to this. Covalent compounds may form ions when react with water. For example, ammonia is a gas when dissolved in water, it forms two pos uh, ions, positive and a negative ion, and they are free to move. So ammonia solution conducts electricity. Hydrogen chloride gas, which dissolves in water to form hydrochloric acid. Acid chemically solutions, uh, they also are composed of positive and negative ions. So yeah, they are also going to conduct electricity. 
Remember, this is a reversible arrow, and this is an irreversible arrow as given in the reminder over here. We'll discuss them further. Uh, this reversible arrow means the reaction can go forward or it can go backward. Irreversible arrow means the reaction can only go forward. Well, continuing with the electrolysis, passing electricity through compounds and breaking them down is basically electrolysis. When you pass electricity through a metal, you'd notice that nothing happens to a metal. It probably may get a little bit hot, but nothing is going to happen to it in terms of breaking it down. You don't break a metal down when you pass electricity through it. But when you do pass it through an ionic compound, whether it's in molten form or it's in solution form, a chemical reaction occurs. So electrolysis is actually a chemical change. This is caused by passing of electrical current. This happens through a compound which is either in molten or in solution state. So that means we are targeting ionic compounds only. We won't be taking samples for covalent. We will not be taking samples for metallic. We'll only be taking examples for ionic compounds. However, there are a couple of exceptions in covalent compounds, so that's something separate. Some important words that we will be using in electrolysis, electrolyte would be a liquid or a solution that can undergo electrolysis or that can conduct electricity, simply speaking. Electrolyte contains ions, and the movement of ions is responsible for the conduction of electricity, uh, electricity and the chemical changes that take place, all right? Which we have discussed that, for example, if we have a solution of, and we have mainly water, we have sodium chloride in water, if we dissolve NaCl in water, we know it is going to get bifurcated into Na positive ions and Cl negative ions. Now these ions are free to move in water. And because of these positive and negative ions, we will be able to conduct electricity. But in doing so, we'll bring about a chemical change. And the study of this chemical change is the rest of the chapter, electrolysis. Now, in order to pass electricity in and out of the electrolyte, we need two rods. We are going to call them electrodes. Carbon is basically used for these rods. I suggest that instead of writing carbon all the time, it's better if you be exact and quote graphite. Carbon is not a conductor in all of its form. However, graphite is a fair conductor. And it's also inert. It means it does not react with most of the things. On the other hand, we can use platinum. Platinum is also inert and can be used instead of graphite. Some other metals are sometimes used as well. The reason we do not prefer platinum is because platinum is extremely expensive. Now, graphite, on the other hand, is extremely inexpensive. It's so very easily platinum available. Stuff? Platinum is like the white gold. All right, uh, let's talk about a little bit of a history to give you an idea. If we go a century or a few centuries back, you'll understand that the currency was not in the form of notes. There were no money notes. The currency was the most uh, unreactive metals, like silver was a currency. Gold has been a currency since uh, a number of centuries. We don't even know how that uh, dates back, but gold has been a century all along. Gold has been a currency all along. Now, gold is usually seven to 10 times more expensive than silver. Platinum is usually a much more expensive. Uh, I can't even say seven to 10 times. It's sometimes even more expensive than gold. There is a jump up. So these, although this wasn't uh, a part of the planet in terms of uh, how openly available it is now because we are extracting more and more platinum out of the Earth's crust, but gold and silver were easily extracted, so they were available around the planet in the form of currency. Now, as you go down the reactivity series, you understand this is least reactive, this one is even more less reactive than this one, this one is Platinum is being the least reactive. So since platinum is inert or unreactive, we prefer it as an electrode. And that's the same reason why we prefer it as a form of currency. 
that, that actually makes it expensive. Remember, something that cannot be attacked by an acid or an alkali or cannot be dissolved by something is not attacked by an oxidizing agent or a reducing agent. We actually like that metal or we li like that element. That's what makes it expensive. All right. Mm -hmm. So its ability to not react make, makes it expensive. Mm -hmm. right. The positive electrode is called the anode. The negative electrode is called the cathode. Names are pretty simple and straightforward. Remember the word panic. We have discussed it in the oxidation reduction topic as well. Now, remember that cations are positive and anions are negative. So cations will get attracted towards cathode. So cathode is going to be negative beta. I shouldn't be writing it over here. It would be difficult for you to read. So let's raise it a little bit. Let's write it over here. So we understand that cations are positive and we understand that anions are negative. Cations will get attracted to the electrode that is known as cathode, and that is because cathode is negatively charged. Anions get attracted towards anode, and we do understand that, and that the anode is positively charged. Negatively charged electrode, why? Because it's connected to the negative end of the battery. Positively charged is an electrode because it's connected to the positive end of the battery. And notice, ode is the last part of electrode, and an is actually coming out of here, anode. Ode is the last part of electrode. Cath is actually coming out of cathode. Mm -hmm. So the names have some similarities to understand. Okay, what we commonly ask, what I commonly ask my students is that to memorize one of these. And one of these sets, you can memorize either this one and that one is going to be exactly opposite in terms of their charges or you can memorize this one and this one is going to be exactly opposite. Trying to memorize all four might make it difficult for you. Uh, however, panic is a very good term to remember this. Positive right. cathode, cathode. All right, so moving on. These are the terms we are going most commonly going to use. We are going to start with electrolysis of molten compounds. So, as soon as I start with electrolysis of molten compounds, the basic diagram tells us everything over here. Notice we have a crucible, or we can use a tub, we can use anything that can work in a similar way. Even a simple beaker can be used for the purpose. Now, uh, it has molten lead to bromide. This time a crucible is being used because why we are heating it. If you're not heating it, if you're using a solution, then beaker is something that is suggested. But if you're heating it, definitely you won't be using glass. You would be using something like crucible. Now for molten systems, yeah, crucibles are preferred, but for solutions, you can go with uh, simple stuff as beakers. Now, these two rods, carbon electrode, remember one of the rod is connected to the positive end of the battery. So definitely this is going to be anode. The other one is connected to the negative end of the battery. Definitely this is going to be the cathode. And whatever uh, positive and negative ions we have over here, the opposite charges are going to attract one another and that's how it's going to work. It's a pretty simple idea. Take a look at this. This is lead to bromide, which means it's PBBr2. All right. So mm -hmm. that means it would give mm -hmm. us PB2 plus. Now I am taking this to reverse over here, plus this tells me that lead is positive two. PR I know is negative one all, uh, most of the time, so there you go. Now it clearly tells you that if there is any PB plus two over here, it would go to this electrode. It also tells us that if there is any BR negative, this is going to get to this electrode. Why? Because the anion goes to the anode, the cation, cation goes to the cathode as soon as we turn the power supply or the battery on. Now the power supply can be a simple six volt battery or a power pack. It doesn't matter which voltage isn't critical either. So 
nothing at all happens until the lead to bromide melts as soon as it melts the bulb lights up it tells us that now the electrons are flowing through it it's conducting electricity there is some bubbling around the electrode anode connected to the positive terminal of the power source i have already talked about this so the after picture for this is this one this after picture gives us the idea that there are some bubbles of bromine over here there is this is bromine gas it is a red brown gas so we would definitely be able to see the color and there is some lead at the bottom of it why because the lead goes to the electrode uh, but metallic lead is found underneath it why this is a metal this is heavy this tends to settle down uh, sometimes the metal tried to stick to the electrode but this isn't the case over here bromine uh, goes out in the form of gas bromine is a liquid but it's a very volatile liquid and at this high temperature this, this would easily be converted into a gas and leave the system <clears throat> so it's a pretty easy uh, thing uh, what we can do easily is that as soon as you stop heating the bromine uh, solidified uh, lead bromide solidifies again everything stops no more bubbling bulb goes out tells you that it's not conducting electricity anymore now i was trying to explain what's going to happen in the background chemistry and the explanation has been done over here in a pretty good way let's go through this lead to bromide is an ionic compound it's a giant uh, ionic structure it has lead to ions and bromide ions packed regularly in a lattice now the ions are locked tightly in the lattice they're not free to move they cannot conduct electricity so uh, until unless the solid melt there's nothing is going to happen and as soon as the solid melts the ions become free to move around it turns on the bulb the electricity is being conducted and we have some chemical changes in the system how as soon as we connect it to the power source it pumps electrons away from the left hand electrode towards the right hand one this means that there are extra electrons at the right hand electrode now let's take a look at it so it is negative this is the right hand electrode negative so it is going to push electrons the electrons will come from this wire all the way to the electrode all right since electrons would be coming over here so anything positively charged in terms of ions will get attracted to it mm -hmm. right and they literally this literal movement can be explained well in terms of a video so i am going to pause our class for just a second and i am going to bring up a video this video is going to give you a very good idea in terms of animation just a minute hello and welcome to get to know science this video is about the basics of electrolysis so electrolysis literally means splitting up using electricity so lysis just means splitting up and the electro part of the word is obviously the electricity part so we're splitting up using electricity and in electrolysis we use electricity to split up a substance made of ions so an ionic substance and we split it up into its constituent substances Here's a typical setup for the electrolysis circuit. There are two electrodes here and here that are dipped into the electrolyte. So this is the electrolyte. One electrode is positive and is called the anode. The other electrode is negative and is called the cathode. And the electrodes are normally made up of unreactive substances like graphite or like platinum and that's in order to prevent unwanted reactions from taking place and the electrolyte is the ionic compound that we want to split up and this ionic compound is either molten 
or it's dissolved in water dissolved in solution and this is to allow the ions to move around so in this electrolyte you're going to have positive ions and negative ions and the ions are going to move to an electrode the positively charged ions will move to the cathode and the negatively charged ions will move to the anode and when the ions reach their electrode they will either gain or lose electrons and will be deposited as elements here's an example lead bromide is a solid and does not conduct electricity but when you melt it the ions can move freely and it can conduct so our electrolyte is therefore molten lead bromide and you can see here the ions that molten lead bromide is made of you have the lead ion and the bromide ions as well and when we turn on the current the positive lead ions flow towards the cathode and the negative bromide ions flow towards the anode so let's have a closer look at what happens when the ions reach the electrodes so what happens when the lead ions reach the cathode is that they gain two electrons from the negatively charged cathode so the lead ion will gain two electrons from the cathode making them lead atoms and the lead atoms are then deposited so they'll end up deposited at the bottom of this vessel here and we say that the lead ions have been reduced because they have gained electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons reduction is gain when the bromide ions reach the positive anode they lose one electron each to the anode and they become bromine atoms and the two bromine atoms immediately bond in pairs to become bromine gas so now we have bromine gas molecules forming at the positive anode and we say that the bromide ions have been oxidized and oxidation is loss of electrons and we can use this to remember what happens at each electrode we can use oil rig because oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons so that's what that stands for and it's a useful way to remember what happens at the electrodes we can also represent what happens at the electrodes using half equations so each of the two electrodes has its own half equation so at the anode this would be the half equation we have 2Br minus, those are the two bromide ions, they lose an electron each, so minus two electrons, and they become a bromine molecule. At the cathode, we have a lead ion, Pb2+, and it gains two electrons and becomes a lead atom so these would be the two half equations for this electrolysis reaction this is the oxidation half equation and this is the reduction half equation and because reduction and oxidation take place at the same time in electrolysis it's often called a redox reaction now, if we carry out electrolysis in water, the situation... So that was to give you the idea about electrolysis in molten solution. Obviously, he's continuing with electrolysis in uh, molten systems, my bad, molten systems. And he was continuing with the electrolysis of solutions, but uh, we're not going to do that today. So I uh, intentionally paused it. Uh, I am 
still trying to find the video that uh, talks about the electrons, the surge from the battery, and because of which the whole thing occurs. So just a minute, and I'll be back with another video. Electrolysis is using an electrical current to bring about a chemical reaction. Not all substances are affected by passing an electrical current through them, only compounds with ionic bonding. The effect is always to break down the ionic compound to produce elements. We use conducting rods called electrodes to pass the electric current through the ionic substance, and it is important that we make these from materials that will not themselves react, such as graphite or platinum. The proper name for the ionic compound we're going to break down is the electrolyte. To be an electrolyte, the ions in the ionic substance must be free to move, not locked up in a giant ionic lattice. So we have to either melt the ionic substance or dissolve it in water before we can get an electrical current to pass through it. We can test to see whether a substance will act as an electrolyte by seeing whether we can pass electricity through it. The electrodes also have special names. The positive electrode is the anode. Because opposite charges attract, the negative ions in the electrolyte, which we could also call anions, will be attracted to the anode. The negative electrode is called the cathode. Positive ions, which are called cations, will be attracted to the cathode. Here's how it works. To start with, the electrolyte contains positive and negative ions, free to move around. When we connect the power supply to the electrodes, the negative ions are attracted to the positive electrode, and the positive ions are attracted to the negative electrode. The negative ions give up the extra electrons from their outer shells to become ordinary atoms rather than ions, and these electrons travel from the electrode to the power supply. Electrons then travel to the negative electrode and into the outer shells of the positive ions, making them uncharged atoms too. So at each electrode, we're turning ions into elements. Two more terms we need to know are the previous part was a great part. Uh, how they have animated it is really great. Now he starts off with some ions in the system. He doesn't even connect it to the battery first. They're random, they're, they're moving around the system as they wish to. But as soon as he connects it to a battery, you'd literally notice them moving and getting attracted to the electrodes respectively, cations to cathode, anions to anode. And not just that, notice that they have their charges in them. The yellow ones have negative charges in them. The red ones have positive charges in them. Once they're attracted, either they give out electrons or they take in electrons. You'll notice that the charge signs would disappear out of them. They are converted into neutral atoms or molecules. Not just that. You'd notice that during this presentation, when they get attracted, he shows literal movement of electrons so much so that these lose the electrons, that's definitely oxidation. Negative ions lose the electrons, so much so electrons literally travel through the wire, go all the way to the battery. This is oxidation, and oxidation is occurring on negative ions. It, he goes on with the process along with the animation, and you'd notice that the electrons literally travel from that battery now onto the other side, towards these red particles, and these are positively charged, they're literally going to gain the same electrons, and they are also going to be converted into neutral atoms. So this gives us a pretty good idea how electrons move through the system, how negative ions lose electrons in order to get oxidized, how positive ions are going to gain electrons in order to get reduced, and thus he would be able to discuss oxidation and reduction or as a whole redox reactions with you. I'll continue with the video uh, and you'll understand how he connects all the dots. Two more terms we need to know are oxidation and reduction. 
oxidation is losing electrons, so the negative ions get oxidized when they lose their electrons at the anode. Gain of electrons is called reduction. The positive ions at the cathode are getting reduced. We can use oil rig to help us remember this. Oxidation is loss and reduction is gain of electrons. So electrolysis is an example of a redox reaction. Some examples will help us understand exactly how this works. The simplest case is electrolysis of an ionic substance which has been heated until it melts. We'll use copper 2 chloride as our example. So we heat the copper chloride crystals until the lattice melts and the ions are able to move freely. Then we connect the power supply and the ions move towards the oppositely charged electrode. From the name we know that the electrolyte contains copper ions with a 2 plus charge, hence copper 2, and we should know that chloride ions have a 1 minus charge because they have a valency of 1 and they are non-metals. A different reaction happens at each electrode. There are really two reactions going on at the same time. The copper 2 plus ions are being attracted to the negative electrode. The electrode gives two electrons to each copper 2 plus ion, turning each into a copper atom. In this way, a layer of copper metal begins to grow on the surface of the cathode. The element copper is being formed. We can show what is happening by writing an equation. Each Cu2 plus ion gains two electrons to become a copper atom. We call this a half equation because the other half of the story is what's going on at the other electrode. The positive electrode has attracted the negatively charged chloride ions. Each chloride ion gives up one electron to become an uncharged chlorine atom. The chlorine atoms bond in pairs to form molecules of the element chlorine, so we see bubbles of pale green chlorine gas forming at the anode. We can use a half equation to show this too. Two chloride ions turn into a chlorine molecule by giving up two electrons. If we combine the two half equations, which we can do by adding them together, we can see that the overall effect of the electrolysis is to turn the ionic compound copper chloride into the elements copper and chlorine. Now we'll take a look at electrolysis. So I hope this gives you a much clearer picture of how this whole thing is going to happen. Yeah. And this clearly gives the student the idea that how the electronic surge, electron surge is going to help us with uh, this whole process. So you get the idea that when the electrons move from one uh, portion of the battery towards the electrodes and how those electrodes are going to help. In this specific case, he was talking about the negative electrode. They are going to come down. They are going to get to cathode. Now, since this was cathode, and we were talking about lead to ions moving towards cathode, remember these ions are short of two electrons. So they are going to get those two electrons and they're going to be converted into lead atoms. So this mm -hmm. is liquid and this would be converted into solid lead, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. On the other hand, what happens is that there are also bromide ions in the system. They get attracted to the positive electrode. When this happens, he has clearly discussed that two bromide ions can lose those electrons. You can either write it like this, and they give us a bromine molecule, which is the brown gas you see over here. Or you may write it like this, two bromide ions are going to give us bromine liquid and the two electrons. Now, since we're heating it up so much, this bromine is converted from a liquid form to a gaseous form because of enough heat. So either you write the equation as given above with negative sign or you write it with positive sign, it means the same thing. And that's how you notice that the ions keep moving towards their respective electrodes in the whole solution area. 
And in the whole uh, wire area, you'd notice that the electrons would keep moving in exact directions of the system to keep the gain and loss of electron balance. So much so that you see that gain and loss in the system in the similar way. By the end of the whole thing, we will be able to convert the lead to bromide compound into one solid lead and two gaseous bromine in two parts. The electrons, as much as they were loose, they were gained by the other substance, so they get balanced. And the same thing which I've shown over here with the help of the diagram, you see over here. So lead two ions attracted to the negative electrode and electrons moving off the electrode to neutralize the lead two ions and convert them into a solid. On the other hand, bromide ions are attracted to positive electrode. By positive, they mean the anode. Since they are anions, they will be attracted to the anode. And they lose the electrons over there, which convert them into a bromine atom. But the problem with bromine atom is that they join in pairs. They quickly make a covalent bond in them, and they convert themselves to bromine molecules. So instead of writing separate equations, we write this overall equation, which gives us the idea that two bromide ions are going to quickly convert themselves into a bromine molecule. Remember, this happens because bromine atom has seven electrons in its outermost shell. It is only going to share one electron each to make a single covalent bond and have eight electrons in their outer, outer shell following the octet rule. So it, it's good to understand for us that bromide ions are attracted to the anode and they lose to form bromine molecule. Bromide is the name of the ion, bromine is the name of the molecule. So it gives us the whole idea. Now, since electrons are flowing in the external circuit, the bulb lights up. That's electricity. So mm -hmm. as soon as we use the word electric, uh, at an external circuit, I hope you understand we're talking about the connected wire, the power pack or the battery, the bulb, the electrode, they're all uh, considered as external circuit. Electrons flow in the external circuit, ions flow in the electrolyte. That's how we conduct electricity. There are charged uh -huh. particles in both the places, but they're different. The wires are having the electrons flow through them, but the liquid, the molten system down below is going to have ions flow in them. So sometimes we use the word discharge or ion. This means they are losing electrons. Discharging means losing the charge, losing their electrons. Uh, this also means gaining electrons for the other side because when we talk about anions, they lose electrons. When we talk about cations, they gain electrons. So we can say they get discharged. Why? They lose their charges. They become neutral. Don't forget, every time we talk about electrolysis and redox reaction, remember oxidation means loss of electron, reduction means gain of electron. The whole oil rig mnemonic is there to help us. So the overall equation for lead is this. The overall equation for bromine is this. Lead is undergoing reduction. Bromine is undergoing oxidation. So this gives us a clear picture of how the redox reaction goes. Reduction in oxidation occurring simultaneously. These equations are known as half equations because one equation tells you about reduction, the other one tells you about oxidation. Combining them both will then be a redox reaction. But usually they don't ask you a redox reaction exams, they ask you to write ionic half equations. And ionic half equations actually represent their respective electrodes. Why? You need to understand something, and this is going to be exactly the same every time. Reduction is always going to occur at cathode. And oxidation is always going to occur at anode. And this is easy enough of a tip for you to remember. All right. Now, I've spent today's date 
just to explain the whole concept. I haven't discussed uh, the tips I were talk uh, talking about previously. So in the next setting, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start off with other examples of molten substances. For example, they're talking about sodium chloride over here, aluminum oxide over here, zinc chloride over here. They're going to discuss many examples before they jump on to aqua solution. So in the next setting, we'll do take these examples of molten systems. We're going to discuss them. And apart from discussing them, I will talk about the three simple tips that always help you to get your molten solution or molten systems correctly. All right? Yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions or should we call it a day? <laughs>